Welcome to the Rebel Souls podcast, where we flip the middle finger to the status quo. I'm your host, Shelly Paxton, lifelong rebel, liberator of souls, and author of Soulbatical, a corporate rebel's guide to finding your best life. Settle in as we dive deep with badass leaders who are rebelling for what matters most in life, business, and the world at large. I'm so happy you're here. Let's get this revolution started. Before we begin, I want to share an offering from my soul to yours. If you've achieved traditional success only to realize that you're living someone else's dream, then this will start you on a profound journey toward becoming chief soul officer of your own life, just like I did. I'm gifting you a free chapter from my book, Soulbatical, A Corporate Rebel's Guide to Finding Your Best Life. It's called Liberating from the Shackles of Should. And if you're ready to, then visit soulbatical.com to download it for free. That's S-O-U-L-B-B-A-T-I-C-A-L.com. Warning, side effects include intense joy and fulfillment. Hello, fellow Rebel Souls. Welcome back to the Rebel Souls podcast. I'm so excited to have you back with me and you will not be disappointed with this episode. It's really interesting because I've also been using this podcast as a grand experiment to not only talk to people who I know and love and am, have no doubt will inspire both you and me, I'm also using it as an invitation to people who I have connected with and want to dive deeper with. And so I'm bringing them on and trusting and surrendering that our conversations are going to be magical. And this is one of those conversations. So our guest today is Cornell Thomas. Cornell and I, we talk a little bit about this in the conversation, but it's like we've been in each other's orbit and his name kept coming up for me and my name kept coming up for him. And we're like, okay, we clearly need to meet each other, know each other, learn from each other, support each other. And so uh, we were introduced twice by different mutual friends and realized that, okay, wait, we really, we really do need to have a conversation. And so I said to him, what if our first conversation happened on my new podcast? Would you be willing to do it and just see where the energy takes us and how the conversation flows and let everyone else peer into that experience? And he, like me, was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. So we we did it. And that's this, this conversation is the result of this episode is the result of um, both of us really leaning in and saying, let's create some magic together. And I was not disappointed. And I know you won't be either. So if you haven't heard of Cornell, man, you're going to love this. Cornell is an author, a coach, I would say speaker, but he prefers professional conversationalist, which I love. And by the end of this episode, I said, I am stealing shamelessly. And I'm going to start using that because I think it's brilliant. And it really, it is different from speaker in a way. And he's also a world life changer. This guy is rebelling for mindset and really shifting into positivity and positive mindsets. And he talks to us about some of his Cornell-isms. In fact, he's just published a book, volume one, of his, I think now over 5,000 positive quotes, aka Cornell-isms, that he's created. And he takes us through a few of his favorites. He also tells us his deeply vulnerable and personal story about what got him to this place, what took him from why me to what now, and to doing this work in the world and following his calling. And it's really powerful. I did not think I could love this guy more. And by the end of our conversation, I'm like, fast friends, we will be doing stuff. We are going to stand on a stage together. And you'll see that we find a lot of 
similarities that we didn't even know we had at the beginning of this conversation. The other thing that I want you to know is I noticed this as I was doing a little research on him. I'm like, wait a second, what's up with Tony Robbins? He's totally plugging your stuff, meaning Tony Robbins is endorsing Cornell. I mean, here's, here's a quote, Cornell Thomas, this is from Tony, you guys. Cornell Thomas is an up and coming thought leader that will inspire you not only to do more, but be more. Tony also went on to write the foreword to one of Cornell's books. And I do say books with a plural because I think he's up to four that are in market now and a fifth and sixth that are ready to come out and a goal of 10 by 2022 that he shares with us in this conversation. So basically he kicked my ass in gear to say, okay, girl, you got to start writing again. So we did a little bit of reciprocal accountability with each other, but it's so, it's so incredible. Everything that he shares, just his way of thinking, his way of creating positive quotes and, and really inspirational language that helps to shift people's mindsets. And it's all based on some really profound stuff that happened in his own life and seeing his own dreams vanish before his very eyes and then realizing I'm going to do something different in my life. And he found his, he found his purpose. And, and I love the way he looks at life. We kind of share the one step at a time approach to making a difference in the world and one one soul at a time. So I I loved this. Cornell is now a a <laughs> I consider him a friend. He's definitely a soul brother. We get into some um we get into some good conversation at the end too around his perspective as a black man in the states and what we can be doing about racial justice and what, you know, for those of us like myself who are white, how we can contribute and be a part of the change. So I love that this is coming up and we're learning, we're learning so much. And this is a really, really beautiful conversation with a lot of laughs along the way. So I will leave that as the intro and tell you, as I always do, to buckle up for more badassery. And let's dive into the conversation with Cornell Thomas. Hello, Rebel Soul fam. Welcome back to the Rebel Souls podcast. I have a good one for you guys today. I'm joined by my new friend, Cornell Thomas. And I've got to tell you guys, this is one of those things in the world where the universe is sending you message after message after message, like you are in somebody's orbit and you must meet this person. And Cornell is one of those people for me. We had so many mutual friends in common. It finally was like, got to reach out, got to make the intro. And I said, what if we did our first conversation as this live Rebel Souls podcast? And he agreed to it. So welcome, Cornell. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Shelly. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. It's you and I have not only people in common, there's so much overlap in our messages. Yeah. And you are you are absolutely a fountain of positivity and you are changing people's lives. And I know it's all grounded in your experience, you know, as, as a human in this world and facing lots of adver adversity as you have, and you've turned that into um, your purpose in life. So I want to dig into that. <laughs> First, I'm going to ask you my favorite question and kind of the defining question of this podcast. What are you rebelling for? Yeah, uh, I would say it's mindset more than anything, because I feel like life is mindset. Everything is controlled by mindset, faith, love, positivity, negativity, everything starts with the mind, starts and ends with the mind. Yeah, I love that. Rebelling for mindset. And I know very specifically, like you really get into positivity. How can you shift your mindset to have that focus? Is that right? Yeah, that's one of the things for sure, positive mindset. But you know, there's also like mental toughness. And I think mm. our resilience comes from there. I mean, literally everything that you can think of is controlled by the mind. Uh, positivity is a big component for me, just, you know, how I was raised and, you know, what I went through in my life and continue to go through in my life. But it's, it's just, there's a whole bunch of things in there that I think is beautiful. And once you start unlocking the mind and realizing 
how important your thoughts are, how they affect your actions directly and indirectly, then I think you you can go towards start leaning towards a more positive life and a more uh, and a better experience on this planet. Yes. And one of the things I love that I've I both heard you say and I've seen written many places is that it, your own experience with ad adversity has led you to this mindset shift of from why me to what now? And that to me is like the most powerful shift a human can make to say, okay, time for that resilience, time to get up, time to move on. And I'm curious, I know your story, but not everybody who's listening or watching this knows your story. Can you give us a little bit of the backstory to what led you to, you know, create that mindset shift in your own life? Yeah. Uh, everything is who I am today, it's all because of my mom. Uh, I always say the great Tina Thomas. It's very hard to say my mom's first and last name without saying the great. Because uh, my father, Bobby Thomas, was a police officer in the city of Passaic, New Jersey, where I'm from originally. He passed away when I was four. And when he passed away, my mom was left with five kids to raise uh, with very little money. My father worked 16 hours a day. Uh, police officer's you know, salary in the late 70s wasn't you know, a lot. So my mom had to figure it out. And she is a solution-based person. She is all about the solution, not about the problem. And when I talk to her, even now, when I talk to her about the past and what she went through, uh, one of the things that she said to me that really stuck with me is, because I asked her, I said, what did you dream about? Like, what did you want to be? And she said, my only purpose once your father passed was for you guys to have a roof over your head, your stomach's fed, and be raised the right way. She's like, that was my only purpose. So mm -hmm. all the dreams that she had after my father passed away, you know, they all passed away with my father. She was like, okay, I got to make sure that these five kids are raised the right way. So she worked three jobs a day. Uh, I, I've never, to this day, I can't remember a time where I came home and saw my mom with her head in her hands when there's pl plenty of days, every day she could have. And she just, you know, she just grinded it out. So being a young man and being the youngest boy, in my family, I was very, I'm still very, very close to my mom. I've always been a mama's boy. I just watched her. Like, I just watched how she worked. And I, I went through life not really being passionate about anything. I was in elementary school, middle school. There was nothing that stuck out where I was like, okay, I want to be this thing. And it wasn't until my, I was 16 years old where I discovered basketball. Mm -hmm. And I first found basketball. My mom is from a small town in, in Virginia called Birds, that's Virginia. And I remember sitting on my cousin's bed one day because there was nothing to do there. And I looked under the bed and I saw all these newspaper articles of him playing basketball. And I didn't know that one, they put kids in the newspaper for a sport. And then my cousin was like, everybody loved my cousin. He was so cool and all the girls liked them. And, and I was like, man, you know, if I play basketball, I could be like my cousin Carlos. And, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be cool. And like at that time, I had like a high top, like a flat top that raised yeah. your hair and but my brother cut it, so it was like always like lopsided. So like I was struggling. My mustache didn't grow in yet. Like I was on the struggle bus. I was a lot of I was in a lot of friend zones. I was getting a lot of friends. Uh, yeah. So like this can be the thing that kind of pushes me over the top and just gives me an identity because I went through life at that point without an identity. I was just so and so's younger brother or Tina Thomas's boy or whatever it was. And so when I first started playing basketball, I didn't realize how hard. <laughs> the game of basketball picking up at 16 was. And I remember my first day walking on the court and just shooting the ball for hours and hours and the ball not going in. And me being like, okay, well, I suck at this. Like, it's never going to happen. And then out of the blue, you talked about in the beginning of the show how people come into your lives for a reason. There was a guy that came across the street from his house, lived across the street from the basketball court I was shooting at in my neighborhood. And he said, hey, my name's Ray. Do you want me to show you how to shoot a basketball? Oh, wow. It's like and your guardian angel. Guardian angel. And it and literally changed the course of my life. Uh, he stayed with me for the next two hours, showed me how to shoot a basketball. And when he left, I still sucked at basketball. But he planted this seed in my head that if I work at this, I could get better. And that's all I needed. And this is what I, when I talk about the mind, this is what I talk, tell people about. You know, we all have gardens in our brain, right? That's all our garden. Whatever you plant grows. So if you want to plant negative stuff, the weeds are going to grow. Right? All the crap that you don't want in your garden is going to grow. If you want to plant, plant positive things, that's what's going to grow. And the cool thing about positivity and negativity is they both work the same way. They need your momentum. So it's whatever one you want to feed, that's the one that's going to sprout. 
So while I had all these people telling me how bad I was at basketball, my brother's old friends, my brother's older than I, my brother's friends, and all these people saying like, "Oh, see, you, you're like you'll never play basketball," blah 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 blah. <laughs> I always kept that in my head that if I just keep working at it, because Tina Thomas showed me how to work. So if I just keep working at it, I can get better. So six hours, seven hours a day was dedicated to basketball. My junior year in high school, I got cut from varsity and like sat, you know, junior varsity. My senior year barely played. And my mom sat me down after high school. And it was the first time in my life that I ever heard my mom say can't. And she looked me right in the face and she goes, baby boy, she goes, I cannot afford to send you to college. Mm. And when my mom said that, like even now when I talk about it, I still get a knot in my throat because I know how much it pained her to say that to me. And like, I'm probably gonna cry, you know, gonna get emotional, but. I knew how hard she was working for us, you know, to move on and go to college, et cetera. So when she said that to me, I was just like, man, like, this is, this is it. Like, I'm not going to go to college unless I figure something out. So I said, mom, I said, I'm going to take a year from school. I'm going to work two jobs. I'm going to go to a junior college. I'm going to get a full scholarship. I'm going to come home and I'm going to play professional basketball. Mm. And she just looked at me and she said, okay, baby boy. She was like, all right, go ahead, go do it. And that's what I did. I went uh, and worked two jobs. I worked at Foot Action. I worked at this pharmacy. I went to a junior college, a two-year college. My first year, I, you know, played a little bit, a little bit more than I did in high school. And then my second year, things clicked. Like everything, like Malcolm Gladwell talks about, you know, on Outliers, when you put your 10,000 hours in, I was like around 11,000 hours. And then it clicked and people were seeing me in the newspaper from high school and they're like, Cornell, there's this guy that has your same name. That's at Sussex County college. I'm like, dude, that's me. (laughs) And they couldn't believe it because here's a guy who didn't even play varsity on the team. That was terrible. And I always say people see where you land. They don't see the work that you've done. Ooh, isn't that the truth? Yeah. So they don't see the journey. So I didn't go to my junior prom, my senior prom. I was out playing basketball. I I remember watching limousines drive past the court when I was playing basketball during my senior prom, my junior prom. So I was willing to sacrifice what I liked in order to get what I love. And a lot of people don't understand how powerful that is. Like I like the idea of hanging with my friends, but I love the idea of my mom never having to work again. So I got good enough in junior college to get a full scholarship to play in North Dakota. I'll never forget telling my mom, you know, that, and she did like, give me this, give me this big hug. And I go to North Dakota a couple months later. I'm in North Dakota, you know, never been there before in my life. Second time on a plane. Uh, and I was just like, wow, this is it. So I played ball there, came back home and I started playing with NBA guys and working out with guys that play overseas and these big pros. And, you know, here I am in this like 1989 Mercury Sable pulling up <laughs> the Lamborghinis and Ferraris and, I'm like, I'm six years removed from getting cut from varsity. And here I am playing with guys that I just watch on TV. So eventually, I, you know, after five, six months, I got a contract to play in uh, Portugal, in Lisbon. And it was the top division. I'm like, oh my, I was like, I'm eight years away from first playing basketball. And here I am, not even seven. Here I am, uh, I have a contract to play basketball. On the doorstep of your dream, exactly. So I tell my mom and my mom, like literally she just hugged me and my mom, Every, everything that I've done each to this day that I tell my mom, it could be the biggest thing. It could be the smallest thing. My mom's never surprised because she knows me, right? So she's never surprised um, what I accomplished. She's always happy for me, but she's never surprised. So I'm a week away from going to Portugal. My girlfriend, who's my wife now, flies down from Seattle. We have this going away party. It's just me, my mom, my girlfriend, and like one of my brothers. We had like no money. So, you know, we just had a small party. And uh, I'm on the court just shooting around with some of my friends. And we start playing three on three. And I go to the basket and I hear a pop. Fall on the ground. My friends come over to me. I go to pick myself up. I can't put any weight on my right foot. And I just, so I'm like, all right, let me just get to the hospital. You know, it's not, it's nothing bad. I was like, I probably just turned it bad. So I go to the hospital, drag my foot up to the emergency room. And I'm not calling my mom because if I call my mom, whatever happens is real right? Whatever just happened is real. So I'm just keeping it to myself, keeping it myself. Then finally the pain was to the point where I had to call my mom. My mom gets down there and this great doctor by the name of Dr. Brad, she goes, Cornell, I'm going to grab the back of your calf muscle 
if you feel excruciating pain, we have to do surgery on Thursday. This is a Sunday. I was supposed to leave the next Sunday. So I got the back of my calf muscle, felt excruciating pain. He said, son, you ruptured your Achilles tendon. And this is in 2001, 2002. So the, the surgery was a lot different. Surgery to Achilles tendon then, it's a year long, a little bit over a year of rehab and stuff like that to get back on the court. So Thursday morning, they wheel me in. Thursday afternoon, they wheel me out. I have a hard cast from the middle of my thigh to the end of my foot. Uh, my, by Thursday night, my contract's already canceled and voided. And then Friday morning, I'm sitting in my room at my mom's house by myself. And my mom comes in, kisses me on the forehead, and I watch her go to one of the three jobs. I told her she'd never have to work again. So that was the hardest day of my life to point to that point because I felt like I let this woman down. Like I felt I was given everything. I didn't care about the money. I didn't care about fame, any of that nonsense. I just wanted the money to give to my mom. Yeah. And here I am, you know, here she is walking out. So I was in complete for a couple of hours. I was in complete why me mode. You know, I was just pissed and I was cursing the heavens. I was like, why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm like good to people. God, why would that this ever, why would you allow this to happen to me? And I just started thinking about my mom and I was like, you've been, you've come home when the lights have been shut off because you couldn't pay the bill. And my mom just hands out flashlights and starts lighting candles. Like literally doesn't break a stride. Or you've been home, we don't have any hot water. My mom boils cold water, you know, puts it in the tub, mixes it with, you know, uh, cold water, hot water, mixes with cold water. And the next thing you know, you can take baths. And I was like, here's this woman who, is your only idol. You've never had a human, another human being as an idol, your only idol. And she's so, so solution-based. You know, at one point in time, what are you gonna say? When are you gonna say what now? Like, what's yeah. the next step? Like, what are you gonna do now? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay. So I call my buddy up, my best, one of my best friends. And I said, Kevin, I said, I need you to pick me up on Monday morning. We're gonna shoot, we're gonna go shooting in the gym. We're gonna shoot baskets. And he sounded like I died. He goes, Cornell, you know, how are we gonna shoot? I said, just pick me up. So for the next six months, I shot from a chair and mm. it did nothing for my basketball game, but it did everything for my, for my psyche. For your mental game. Yeah, exactly. So it took me, it took me six months, seven months, eight months, nine months to finally get back. And right when I was getting close to hundred percent, I got an opportunity to be the head coach of the junior college that I played at. And I didn't want it at all. So I was, I'm here, I am 24 years old. I'm like, some of these kids are 22 because junior college, you could go there at any age. And I said, I don't want this. And my mom said, just go on the interview because my old coach was now the athletic director. So I go on the interview and then Shelly, two days later, I'm, I'm a head coach. I have a whistle around my neck and, you know, I'm coaching these kids from all over the place, inner cities. They're up in this rural area where the junior college is. And I have to teach these kids at 24 years old. I don't even know how to be a man. I have to teach them how to be, you know, responsible young men, to care for one another, to love one another. And that started my coaching journey for six years at Sussex. And then I went to Blair Academy uh, for another seven years, but four years into that, three years into that, uh, me and my wife were about to have our first child. And I started to have this pivot that there was more than just basketball. Yeah. And that's a, we were talking about purpose before we started recording. And it's such a beautiful thing, but it's so freaking scary when it first happens. Because when your identity is wrapped up in a basketball or wrapped up in a label that someone else has given you, it's very hard to say, well, what could I possibly be next? And I, when people are like, oh man, how'd you start speaking? Did you go to so-and-so's coaching course? I'm like, no, I was on Facebook and I was reading how negative it was. And I had a book of positive quotes. I took a quote out, put it on Facebook and people liked it. So I started doing that every day. And one day I woke up, I couldn't find the book. And I looked at the screen and I made my own quote. And people still liked it. So I'm like, well, screw the book. I'm just going to make my own quotes every day. So I started making my own quotes. And five, six months went by. My friend Steph came up to me and she goes, where do you get your quotes from? I said, I just make them up. <laughs> up here. <laughs> yeah, I was in my mind. She goes, you should write a blog. I said, what the hell is a blog? I had no idea. And she goes, she, we were in Panera Bread in Rockaway, New Jersey. And she set up a WordPress site for me in Panera Bread. And I wrote my first blog in Panera Bread. Uh, it was called Risk. And every Saturday, I wrote a blog, and I called the blog power, The Power of Positivity, which ended up becoming the, the title of my first book. Name of the book, right. Yeah. So I started saying, after the book came out, I was like, I want to share my story. So I just started, 
you know, speak in front of two people, five people, 10 people. I didn't care. Any, anywhere that would have me for free. I spoke for free for like eight months, nine months. And then I got an opportunity to speak in Las Vegas at an event for free. Uh, and then from there, though, uh, I got offered a chance to speak in Wisconsin and Michigan. And now people are like, well, why is Cornell speaking Vegas, Wisconsin, Michigan, some places in New Jersey? He's been to Boston. Oh, he must really be a speaker. And so then I started getting, and then, you know, 2015, I went to England. And then after that, it was, then it was a wrap. Then I'm well, going now, now you're officially a world <laughs> famous speaker. Well, yeah. Yeah. But that's how, that's, that's how my, that was my story in a nutshell. And this not, and it's such, thank you for sharing all of that. And it's in so vulnerably, right? Like I, okay, first of all, I have to say, I so want to meet your mom. Like I, <laughs> as I heard that story and as I've heard you talk about it before, yeah. I'm like, Tina Thomas is a badass. Like I need to meet this woman. <laughs> she sounds incredible. So I just, I love how you talk about her. I love how much you've learned from her. So thank you for sharing that piece, um, that just that piece of your story. And, and also what you're talking about right now is like one step at a time. I love that. You're like, well, wait, I put up one quote. Okay. Interesting. People like it. I put up another quote. Then I start making up quotes. You don't have to have this grand vision. Yeah. You didn't have to understand your big purpose, which I think seems so overwhelming to so many of us. You're like, I'm just going to put one foot in front of the other and see what happens. Same with speaking to two people and then five people and then 10 people and then suddenly 5,000 people and then suddenly getting paid for it. So do you talk to people about that as well? Like that journey is like one foot in front of the other. It's so beautiful the way you just put it because that's exactly what it is. Every quote that I made was another step. That's it. Yeah. And it's like, it's not a big, huge leap step. It was just a little baby step. And I tell people like, even baby steps are steps. If you put a baby in a corner and they just learn to walk, it's taking these little steps. It might be an hour, but it's going to get to the kitchen, yeah. right? Like the baby's going to get there, right? It's just, we, we compare ourselves to other people so much and other people's journeys so much without knowing their story or their history or their background that we assume that we have to have the same progress as this person at the same amount of time. And that's yes. the part that's terrible. Like we should, you go at your rate, you go at your pace. You know, I'm not Shelly and Shelly's not me. Like we're not each other. So if you're, if it takes you a year to do a book and it took me three years and so be it. Great. Cool. You know what I can do? I can't say Shelly. Well, how did you, what did you, what some of the things that you had in this process that were, kind of like set you back a little bit. Like what took some time from you? But that's, and that's the thing I love about you is that the reason we know so many people in different circles because you're so open to connect with people and learn from people and share your information with people. And that's the beauty of being a super connector, not just a connector, right? Yeah. The super connectors, it's not just a one-sided thing. They know who to connect the right people to and they also learn from everybody that they talk to. Yeah. You know, that's why when you message me, I'm like, this is like the second time that this woman has come up in my periphery. And these are people that I'm close with that I really care about, that really care about her. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I got to look into what she's doing. And, and here we are. Yeah. And here we are. No, I, I, I agree. And it's like, you guys, the, the message here is pay attention to those signs. I think sometimes we're moving so fast and one of the gifts I think this whole pandemic has brought us is it's slowing us down. It's slowing the world down. So let's pay attention, pay attention internally, pay attention to those signs. Let's see them and appreciate them and nurture them. Because I think so many times we're like, you know, going 60 miles an hour in a 30 zone, right? So it's like, yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at, if you look at like a silver lining approach to things, right? And if you think about the pandemic, I went to get my son and my daughter uh, bikes about a month ago. And I just happened to be driving past and it looked like the store was closed. We just pulled up. I want to see, I want to like kind of look in the window and this guy, Jesse was in, he works there and he was in the front and he was waiting for someone to come and get their bikes. So he goes, I said, Oh, you guys are closed. I don't want to buy. He goes, no, 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 you can look around. So we ended up getting two bikes for my kids. And he goes, you know what I'll tell you? He's like, we've never been this busy. I said, what do you mean? He goes, never in the history of our bike shop. He's like, we're on back order by three weeks. He said, because families are getting out and biking with one another. They're spending time together. 
mommy and daddy aren't doing a nine to seven and sometimes taking their work home. So they're seeing their kids for more than an hour. So does homeschooling, is that something I want to do for the rest of my life? Hell no. Hell no. I said, but the fact that I have my kids here and the fact that I can hang out with my family and we can do stuff and they wake up and daddy's there, there's nothing better than that. You know, people, these parents are like, I can't wait till the kids go back to school. You just wait until they go back to school. You're going to have a hole in your heart because they're gonna be gone for six hours. I don't want my kids, I, I want them to stay with me as long as possible. Yeah. Because the school has them longer than you do during the week, right? Which I think one, you know, this is a whole another conversation, but one of the problems with education is the fact that kids are there so long, they're not with their family as much. You know, there's gotta be some type of balance, you know? So I, I love the fact that I'm able to hang out with my kids and like ride bikes and, and, and kick with my kids all day. Well, and it's so nice, right? It's like, I think family dinners have become a thing again. Yeah. So how, how long do people go where it's like, yeah, we were spending so much more time at work. Kids yeah. were spending so much more time at school. And how many times were we blowing off family dinners? And yeah. so that's become a thing. So you're right, all of that quality time. So I'm definitely a silver lining thinker. And I'm a believer that every crisis comes to teach us something. Yeah. And I think there are many somethings as individuals, as families, and as a collective society that, that we learned in, in all of this. And you have, I wrote down some of your quotes because I, I have to tell everybody, like, I do avidly follow you. I try to join your lives when I can, but I avidly follow your feed on Instagram, which I love. And we'll, we'll definitely include all of the ways to, to follow you. But I wrote down, adversity will teach you about you faster than any book and I loved that so much because I think, and believe me, this is like, I have probably every self-help book on the bookshelf in the other room. Like I am definitely, I'm way into personal development and self-help. And yet I also realize that it's in the, you know, it's in the looking inside and we're so often looking for an answer outside of us and in the pages of a book when it's like, actually, that's not the case. Yeah. I just there's, thought that was so beautiful. Thank you. There's um in 12 years, 13 years ago now, I started doing uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, right? And the reason I, I got a, a really addicted to going doing jiu-jitsu is because the first day I went there, I was way bigger than I am now. I was like 280. I was a former athlete. I was just like big guy. And they paired me up with this kid that was 16 years old, looked like Harry Potter. He's a good friend of mine now. but um, And he just destroyed me, like literally destroyed me. And I'm like, how in the world can this kid, who I'm 150 pounds heavier than, destroy me like this? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm so bad at this that I have to come back and learn. And in jiu-jitsu, you're in bad positions no matter how good you are, all the time. And you've got to use your mind is more than you have to use your physical talent to get out of it. So it really, I loved it because it, Every day I go on the mat, I learn a little bit more about myself. Like, who am I when I'm in this terrible position? And I just feel like just quitting. Or am I going to give myself a second, another second or two to think and try to work my way out of it? So you have to, it ends up teaching you to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And we're just not wired that way as human beings, right? Whatever it is, we're not wired to stay in the uncomfortable and say, let me chill here real quick and discover who I am. Once things get uncomfortable, we run, right? We get the fight or flight and we're like, oh, flight, I'm out. Cause we have this survival brain that's millions of years old or whatever. So I like, I, you know, I, start, I started skateboarding like seven months ago and my wife and everybody's looking at me like, what's wrong with you? Like, what, <laughs> really, what bath salts are you eating? Like, why are you taking up skateboarding? Like you're, you're like early forties, like you're gonna fall and kill yourself. You're a big guy. I was like, because I'm not good at it. And I want to roll around with my son. And when he's yeah. using the scooter, I want to roll my skateboard. I was like, and then I got addicted. I was like, well, let me see if I can learn some tricks. You know, not a ton, but like, let me just work on it. So I have no problem being the worst student in the room. Because, I love that. Yeah. Beginner's mind. That's exactly yeah. what you're describing. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's all. If you don't have that in jiu-jitsu or martial arts in general, you, you'll, you won't continue. You'll quit right away. You have to have a beginner's mind. I've, I've been a black belt for four or five years, I still feel like it's the first day I've ever gotten jiu-jitsu. Because jiu I go there like, oh my gosh, there's so many things I can learn. And these guys that are under me 
are so freaking good because I can't trade as much as I used to, but I trade like twice a week. I'm like, these guys are so freaking good. Like, this is amazing. So I go in there with no ego and I go in there just thinking to myself, what am I going to learn today? Well, that's, I mean, honestly, what a great way to wake up in general. What a great lesson. We should all be waking up and saying, what am I going to learn today? Yeah. How exciting is that to think about like, oh my God, an entire day, day of unexplored opportunity, an entire day of things that I've never even heard of before, you know, even learning this from you today, right? Like this is one of my favorite parts about doing a podcast. I know you have, you actually have two podcasts. Yeah. And it's Going like, on a third. Going on a third. Oh my God. Okay. We're going to get into your podcast and your books <laughs> books in just a second. I wanted to highlight something that you said as you were describing the jujitsu challenge, it was like you hit on the power of the pause, mm -hmm. like pausing in that discomfort is where all the growth comes from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but, and we don't, we don't do it because you're right. We run or we numb. A lot yeah. of times we're numbing too. Right. And I, I'm so guilty of that. I wrote about that in my book. I was just like, Oh no, no, I could just keep tamping it down and ignoring it and whatever. And it's like, well, no, actually you can't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. always going to come back to haunt you at some, at some point, but the power of just like that pause and going, I know, I know I'm going to learn from this moment. I know I'm going to see something. I'll understand what the next right step is if I just pause. Yeah, even when you speak, right? You're a speaker, yeah. so even as a speaker. I remember when I first started speaking, when I would get to the uh, the vulnerable points in my in my talk, in my conversation, I would speed through it because I, I didn't want to be vulnerable. I was very, very introverted uh, emotionally for a very long time. And I wanted to just rush through it. So I, I would joke through it or whatever. And a friend of mine said, Cornell, you got to let the audience sit with that. Like you got to let them sit with that and you got to be vulnerable. And I was scared to do it because I'm like, I don't want to start crying or start getting emotional. Like, what if I can't get it back? And it's like, you just pause, right? And you let your point sit. And then you go on to your next thought. And uh, people that are getting into speaking, you have to understand the power of pausing. Because when you pause, not only, it's like every time you pause for that second, two seconds, you can kind of just collect your thoughts again and go wherever you want to go. or it gives you a second or two to read the audience and say, okay, well, where do I want to take them now? Right? Because there's times where I'm in the middle of speech. I'm like, I want to take them somewhere different. Yeah. Right? And that's why I say, I say, I don't call myself a speaker. I call myself a professional conversationalist because we're just having a conversation. Because if me and you are having a conversation and you bring up something that I think is fascinating, I don't have an agenda in the conversation. I'm just going to go where the conversation goes. You know, the only problem with that title is it's so freaking long. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that people don't want to be like, all right, today we have professional conversationalists and all, but that's, that's what I, that's what I call myself. It's like, I'm, I, I love get paid that. Conversations. I love that. Well, we said we had an agreement at the beginning of this conversation that we were going to follow the energy. Hmm. And to me, that's like, that's where all, that's where all the magic happens is in that space of following the energy and not having an agenda. I come out of the school of improv. I studied here at Second City in Chicago way back when in my twenties. And so that idea of yes, and that idea of just being open to possibility, keeping that door open is how I live my life. I call my life, life unscripted. <laughs> I should maybe write that book one yeah. day, but it's beautiful, right? Because that is where the magic happens. You want to know why we're a hundred percent related right now? You want to know why? Why? I just graduated from UCB last year. I love UCB. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yet another connection. Another improv connection. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> Upright Citizens Brigade always makes me think of Amy Poehler, who I went to college with. And oh, then wow. Amy and Tina were here in Chicago. I don't know her. Um, I used to go see her. There was a um, quick side note. There was a um, campus improv troupe called My Mother's Flea Bag at Boston College where I went to school. And Amy was in that and I loved her. And then she and Tina both came to Chicago around the same time I was here starting my advertising career. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously I wasn't good enough at improv to kind of take the route that they did, but I had so much fun. And I say, so for anybody who hasn't taken improv and Cornell, I'm so curious if you agree with this. To me, it is the secret of success in life. And I had no idea at the time. It's like, 
like just the, the rules, the collaboration, the trust, the surrender, the yes and all of it. I was like, oh, that's how I got to be really, really good in leading teams and, and tap dancing in boardrooms and all the things that I did in the corporate world, right? Yeah. It's letting go of your, your limiting thoughts, right? Because yes. we do scenes and they bomb, right? They suck. And you're still thinking about your first beat scene, right? And you're like, oh, I have a second beat coming up. And here I am still wrapped up in how bad the first beat was. Like I have to get rid of it and go on to the next thing. So I used to find myself, I was gonna do improv for just one class. I was gonna do just the one-on-one and I'm doing the one-on-one and we had our show and I go, I have to do two old. And then it's like, I had to do 301, then I had to do 401. Like, I have to do these things because it's showing me so much about myself. I mean, we're in, in a classroom for three hours and I'm in the back line, right, as they're performing, thinking about, oh, what should I do this? Or should I? It's like, no, why don't you just step out? Like, I had such great teachers. And one of the things that I used to say that I used to love is like, just step out. It doesn't matter if you have something that you don't have. This is improv. It doesn't matter what you want to say. You might not have a premise. You might just be brave enough to step out. So I used to force myself to step out first. And if the scene bombed, it bombs. Who cares? You throw it away. And that's the great thing about improv I love besides the agreement and the listening. And, you know, it's throwing away things. Like, just throw away that bad scene. Throw away that, you know, your partner did was completely lost what you were trying to say. Throw it away and then go on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah. And no, there's always going to be something else, right? And mm -hmm. keep stepping out. Yeah. Right? You just keep letting yourself go out there. It's like Brene Brown says, it's like, you got to get in the arena. So stepping yeah. out is getting in the arena. Sure. sure. I love that you did improv. That's, that doesn't surprise me at all, but I love it. Yeah, that. I know. And it doesn't come up that often in conversations. And it's really, really fascinating that's coming up right now because I was just having a conversation with a coach friend yesterday. Well, he's a friend who's also a coach. And I was saying, what am I going to do for this group thing that's coming up? And I said, I had this little idea that maybe I'll talk to them about improv and how life unscripted is actually the secret to life. Yep. And so I was just, this has been on my mind. So I love that it came into this conversation. So this is such a good example. I throw it into the Positivity Summit. We do improv um, exercises. Uh, I give in a circle. We do like zip, zap, zap. And like, all, like we do all these like little improv exercises just because it loosens everybody up. It does. Okay, so this is a good bridge. Can you talk about the Global Positivity, Positivity Summit? Because you run this every year, right? Yeah, a couple of times a year. My, my goal has always been to run um to run you know four to five a year and i think the most that we got to was because of covid we had three or four this year we've got to two and so i was at a 2015 uh, a friend of mine bought my ticket to go to a tony robbins event which i i'd have to sell my my kidney if I, to go to it so i go to this event and tony when i first started doing quotes i would send tony quotes and everybody like anybody that had a big following i'd send them quotes because i'm like if they retweet it then their people can can feel good. And I only have four people that follow me and he has 2.5 million. Yeah. So if he retweets it, then 2.5 million people are gonna possibly see it and then I can do more in the world. So I didn't care about uh, the clout or you know people following me off his stuff. I didn't care about that at all. And I remember like, a, like three, four months into me writing quotes, I was doing a basketball clinic and my phone was just going bzz, bzz, bzz. Like it's, it, it sounded like a bug zapper. And I pick up my phone, I'm like, what in the heck is going on? And I have 400 notifications or something crazy on Twitter. And I'm like, what is happening? And I looked and I scroll all the way down and Tony retweeted one of my quotes. And he ended up retweeting my quotes every couple of weeks. He retweet my quotes. Wow. And so my friend, um, Evan, when she paid for me to go to this uh, date with destiny, I wrote, looking forward to going to date with destiny. And Tony messaged me and said, you know, as you know, I retweet a lot of your quotes. I'm looking forward to meeting you. And I told Evan, I said, you know, who does his Twitter? Because she used to work for him in Europe. And she goes, he does his Twitter. So I was like, well, he messaged me. She goes, what? He doesn't message anybody. I said, well, he messaged me. And so like, I go to this date with Destiny. Uh, he asked a question the first day. I raised my hand. He calls me right away. There's 3,500 people in the main room, 1,500 people in the room. And we have a 10 minute conversation about the first time that I ever started speaking. And he's laughing and, you know, we're hanging. Because humans don't make me nervous. Like, I really don't care what your title is or who you are. I respect what you do, but, like, humans just don't make me nervous. So, we're, you know, have this great conversation. And after the event, I messaged him and said, 
you know, I went to see, someone told me that you were the best speaker in the world and I'm very competitive. That's why I went to see The Day With Destiny. Cause I was like, this guy's not better than mine. You know, so like, that's how I was saying, like going in, I'm like, there's yeah. no way he's better than mine. And so like, and so he, you know, laughed and I said, I would love for you to, to write the forward to my next book. And that's how we started that relationship. Like he, he, Oh, that's so bold and beautiful. I love it. He wrote, the, he wrote a testimonial on my third book. Um, so I saw this and actually it's so funny. I'm just looking at my notes right now and I circled Tony Robbins and I wrote backstory question mark because yeah. I was like, you have the most incredible endorsement from Tony Robbins. And then I saw the, the foreword and I was like, holy shit, man, this is amazing. I need to know. Okay, so yeah. that is the coolest story. But I, when I was sitting at the event, I was sitting there and, and we were supposed to do some partner project or something. And I was looking around and I said, this is a really cool event. It's a very nice event. I said, but you know, this event is a represent isn't a representative of most people because most people don't have 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. Right. I said, I want to run an event where it's not just me talking. I want to run an event where I have speakers from all different races, backgrounds, religions, etc. They each get 20, 25 minutes and they share their story. No agenda, not nothing about your coaching program, nothing about, you know, the, the, whatever you're selling your t-shirt, you can do that at the back of the room, but just share your story because I believe that the thing that connects us the most as humans is adversity. So I said, I'm going to write, so I, I'm writing away and my partner goes, what are you writing? It was like two hours. I said, I just wrote my purpose project. So I, I explained to her the positivity summit and she, I was like, and the thing I want to do also is I want to have a day of speakers and I also want to have half the day I want to do some type of outreach, you know, where we can help, you know, some type of wherever city we go to. We can yeah, help. the community. Yeah. And so she's like, that's great. That's great. And so I started it, you know, a year later, uh, we had 35 people, no sponsors at all. And just kind of figured it out. So we went to New Jersey, then New York, then LA, then we were in, in London in October. And, you know, I'm doing this all by myself. You know, I had a couple of friends in London, uh, two, I call them the two Lisas, my two really good friends, Lisa Skift and Lisa Knight, that helped me organize the London one. But other than that, I've, I've done all this by myself. We've only had one sponsor and the sponsor was like, hey, here's, you know, a thousand dollars or here's whatever and the events like who knows you know i mean events cost money but all these people have shown up for me my speaker friends that i met from speaking all over the world have shown up and have done this for free for me um ever since the second one so uh, i was supposed to do one in toronto and dubai this year but now because of covid i'm going to push it so we did a global one online and I have yes, just in May, didn't you? Yeah. And Mike Vacanti, our mutual friend, was part of that. Yeah, we had a whole bunch of people. Claude Silver was there. Um, Claude's you know, we amazing as well. Yeah. yeah it's awesome. So we had all these people there that came on for free uh, just to come and help out and share their story. And I'm looking forward for things to open up again it's because there's nothing like the energy of the positivity summit when you're there. There's nothing. Yeah, like, I know, believe that. I want to come to one. Well, Sally, you have to come to one. Yes, I will. You're, you're I, not, I, you're, already, I, you're, already, you're already there. Yeah, good. Okay. I, well, let's put that intention out into the universe because <laughs> I believe that will make it happen and hopefully the universe will start to open up. I do have a question though. Are you going to try to do another virtual one before the end of this year if things are really, really slow yeah, to open up? For sure. Yeah, good. I'll have to come, have you come on and speak for sure. Yeah. But, but I would. Yeah, would we'll love to do another virtual one if things don't open up, because the inner the man it was the energy from this one, it was it was just so crazy. We were raising money for our family. Um, I didn't I didn't advertise it because I don't when I give I kind of just I'm under the radar with it. We were we were uh, raising money for a, a family who lost their father. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, husband. One lost her husband. He was a firefighter at Passaic, uh from COVID. And so I'm oh, like, all right, wow. let's raise some money for the family under the radar. And uh, so that's why we try, you know, I charge like 49 bucks or something. But the next ones that I do is going to all be $10 online. Like it's, I'm going to charge everything to be 10 bucks. And I'm going to just try to get tons of people and then just donate it to wherever we can donate it to or who we can help. And because uh, I, I just love the energy of the room. The people were so fired up. I mean, we had speakers from Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Africa. I mean, we had people from everywhere. We had like, That's so awesome. It was, it was insane. So I'm excited for the next one. 
I love that. And it, it does seem more diverse, I think, than some of what, what Tony does and who shows up for Tony's. And you're right, because it's a really high bar in terms of the investment you have to make. And, you know, I know that works for a lot of people, but it doesn't work for a lot of other people. So I love that you're kind of democratizing like access to this kind of positivity and this kind of um, event. Or I shouldn't even say event experience. It's much more than an event. Oh, I'm so excited. I would love to participate. I would love sure to is. speak at it. Um, I wanted, I just wanted to make sure we brought it up because I'm like, if you're doing another one, I want everybody who is listening to or watching this to know and to be on the lookout and to follow you. And we'll get, we'll get into all of that because I have heard from people how impactful it is and just seeing your lives. I'm like, I'll follow Cornell anywhere around the world. So just know that. Just know that. And like your newest groupie. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I, and, I'm, and I'm yours. I think you're awesome. Great. Oh my God. I love it. So, okay. Now let's get into talking about your podcast and your books because, yes. well, your podcasts and your books. Yeah. So you got a lot of plurals there, man. You are quite prolific in what you put out into the world. I didn't even know about half this stuff. And I started digging. And I, one of my favorite things in the world is to go down like a rabbit hole of somebody yeah, yeah. who I'm so fascinated by. And so I was like, oh my God, one book. Okay. Power of Positivity. Then I know second book. I'm like, oh my God, he has another book. It's called yeah. The Power of Me. And then I see the third book, Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And then I go on your website and I'm like, wait a second, did he just launch a fourth book? Did you just, because I saw this on your, on your Instagram. So is this the, what is it? The Cornellisms? Book of Cornellisms, yes. The Book of Cornellisms. Okay, we got to talk about the Book of Cornellisms. So is this you taking like these brilliant quotes and vocabulary and everything that you've created and now sharing? Sure, yep, that's it. So I have about 5,000 Cornellisms since I've been, since I've started. So I took like, I think a, 1500 or something like that and i put them in this book and that's why i said volume one because i'll put another one out there because i make a new one every single day so my fifth book actually is finished it's edited i just have to get it published now because it's been i still have to shoot the cover and it's like so much stuff with the COVID stuff but it's that that book is called game of death and it's all about entrepreneurship Ooh. about the real entrepreneurship like you like the stuff that me and you would talk about not yeah. how do we six figure blah 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 in one week you know like not that crap. You know, well, that's all bullshit. That's yeah. all bullshit anyway, right? That's just basically like trying to hook somebody into something that's yeah. not so that's real. Gonna, so that's going to be my fifth. My goal is oh, I love it. by the end of 2022, I want to have 10 books out. Um, so that's practically tomorrow, my friends. Like yeah, that's him. Oh my God. You're amazing. Yeah. Game of Death is finished. That's five. My kid's book just needs to be published. That's six. <gasps> What's your kid's called, book? It's called Charlie, Charlie the Star. Charlie, so what's the premise of the story? Uh, it was a star that uh, was flying, you know, through the galaxy with his friends and lost his confidence and fell to the earth. And he, uh, old man Hope, is uh, encouraged him back to realizing that he always had his powers. He didn't lose it. He just lost his, lost his confidence and then gets him back into the sky. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I wrote have it when my son was born, like a long time ago. I just haven't gotten a chance to publish it. Have you shared it with your kids? Yeah. Yeah. I Do mean, they I love it? I'm emotional when I share it with the kids. I'm just like, okay. So I picked it because my son Bryce, I showed him, the, uh, no, Naya. I showed Naya the picture when she was like one or two years old and she put her hand on the computer and she started touching the computer. That's mm -hmm. how I knew the illustrator got it right. I was like, okay, Naya likes this. And I said, okay, cool. And, and it was cool for me because I, the only person in the, in the, in the story besides uh, Charlie is old man hope and i got a chance to make him an african-american male because there's not a lot of african-american people in like children's books yeah so i got a chance to put old man hope as this wise sage you know person that looks like me you know like but older and i'm like you know this is it's important for kids to see the diversity because i always say there's no diversity in books and it's like it doesn't it's not a depiction of what the world is now it's better now it's starting to get better people are sort of pump stuff out but when I was growing up, all the books that I saw, you know, I never saw anybody that represented like what I looked like. And I was just like, oh, well, you know, it's like Superman and Wonder Woman and Batman and all these people. Yeah. And then you start to see more. So hopefully this is encourages uh, a young kid to see that and say, wow, you know what, this is possible. Maybe I want to write books or maybe I can be, you know, this person or whatever. But um, in the next book that I'm writing, actually, I have the chapters down, the chapter titles down. That's part of my process is to get the 
the I get the title first of the book and then the chapters uh, is about is about race, uh, and it's all about us coming together and, and unifying. And if it wasn't for mindset, the second thing would be humanity. That's what I'm rebelling for, is just yeah. for us to come together and and realize the powers that be that are trying to divide us on a daily basis. They're not going to win because love is going to beat all that stuff, you know. So yeah. that feels like a an important one to just let sink in. You're exactly right. And we need more people rebelling for unity and humanity and love. Mm -hmm. it's, that's it's, what, that's how we win. That's how we collectively win. That's how we win. There's a word that I love. Uh, I'm actually have shirts coming out in a couple of weeks. It's called Ubuntu and it's uh, U B U N T U. And it means I am because we are. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. South African, isn't it? Is that from Zulu? Yeah. I spent a fair amount of time down in South Africa yeah. in my corporate world. Yeah. Oh, I love it. So I, so I talk about, I used to say in my team, my basketball teams in junior college that I used to coach, we used to say Ubuntu in the huddle because I learned it in 2009. And I saw, heard an NBA coach talking about it and he said what it meant. And I said, this is too powerful for us not to say this. So we would say Ubuntu in the huddle. And the, I have it on my wrist. I have like one of my band says Ubuntu on it. Love so it. it always stayed with me. And I, I've always felt if we live the more Afrocentric mindset where it's, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. You know, Ubuntu, I am because we are. If we live that and start instead of trying to push each other down to climb up to a mountain, we'd be more like Sherpas and helping each other up the mountain, right? What's the mountain if you climb it and no one else is with you, right? So it's, yeah. it's so important for us to, collective as a collective come together and start lifting one another up and helping one another regardless of what you look like or who you pray to or what gender you are whatever none of the nonsense labels right so that's why when i meet shelly paxson's and Dwight mm. Coffees and people like you i'm like there's always hope because we're finding each other and there's nothing they can freaking do to stop it right there's no. nothing to do from stopping us from finding each other because it's divine energy that's connecting us I agree. And we're, we are using our collective platforms. We're almost like merging our platforms. They're going to become one. And yeah. that's really beautiful. And so when I saw your storytellers podcast, mm -hmm. that is also kind of taking that tradition and bringing it forward in podcast, isn't it? It's telling some of those African stories, proverbs. Is, is that what it is? Well, it's, it's everyone's stories. Right? Oh, everyone's stories. Okay. But, it, but it's that type of mindset. So a griot, G-R-I-O-T, was in Africa, was someone that collected the village's stories. So everybody in the village, he was the library. He was the village library. So people would tell him stories or her, him or her stories, and they would keep the stories. So when they said a griot passed away, it was almost like you lost your library. So they would pass it through the generations. So you'd have families of griots. And I want to get a t-shirt that says griot because I'm a first generation storyteller and, and my son and my daughter tell stories to me all the time. So they're going to be like second generation story storytellers. And people are fascinated by stories. And that's why I want to have storytellers because I wanted people to come on and sh just share who you are and how you got here. And it's so cool, you know? So uh, and when I have you on there later on in, in my, in, you know, once I get all these yeah. other ones, you know, you know, you'll see, it's just a conversation. It's just like this. The beautiful thing about your podcast, Shelly, is that it, you automatically, you disarm anybody that will come on here with like an agenda or, you know, it's like, no, we're just going to sit and talk. We're going to chill and have a conversation yeah. and we're going to see where it goes. And that's the, that's what I love about the podcasts that I listen to are like that. It's just like this one, where it's Me like, we're just talking, it's like, oh, it's been an hour. Like, you don't even know, right? So the Storytellers podcast is about that. Population Unplugged is all just me. And I had one, I had it going a year and a half ago, and I had a producer, which was a friend of mine, he used to down the street, and he used to produce the show, and he opened up a jiu-jitsu school, so he couldn't do it anymore. So it took a seven-month hiatus. So I had to start it over again. So now we're 27 episodes in, or 25 episodes in. And it's just me sharing my thoughts. And I don't know where it's going to go sometimes. It's just like, okay, I want to talk about this. Like the last one was about uh, July 4th, you know, what it means to, you know, people of color. I did one. I mean, it's everything. And even from like me just telling silly stories about me as a child, you know, it's just like a free format. And the third one, I can't disclose what that's going to be yet, but 
It's gonna be. It's gonna be like yeah. cliffhanger, <laughs> total cliffhanger. <laughs> it's gonna be an audience participation podcast. Oh, okay. So is there is there sort of a, an estimated time of arrival in our lives when this is coming out? I will tell you uh, if it is not out by August tenth, then I need you to fly from Chicago, fly here, and say, Cornell, what are you doing with your life? And kick your ass. Okay, yeah, done ass. deal. Don't, don't hold back. Do okay. not. Okay, that's good. Well, I kind of need to, I think we have sort of a, we're going to have some reciprocity going on here because you are totally inspiring me. I have like fallen out of my writing routine, like writing this book last year, it was really, really, it was labor of love and it was very emotional because so much of it is memoir. And so I was almost recovering from the writing of the book last year. And now I'm like, okay, I need a little ass kicking to get back into writing more and start starting to queue up the second book and maybe yeah. even third book. So you've totally inspired me on that front too. So I will, uh, I'll get a reciprocal ass kicking if I don't start to I'll like, yeah. Like, if, hey, what do we say? Shelly, come on. I know. Bro. I love it. Okay. So I want to talk about the book of Cornellisms. Are there a few, so volume one, because I know probably like book seven through 10 could just be more, more yeah. volumes yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. of that. So I would love for you to in, like drop more pearls of wisdom with the audience. Are there a few you can read to us or just share off the top of your head? Because uh, I well, just well, love well, listening to you. Thank you. Off the top of my head, I can tell you for sure the one that I resonates a lot with me is uh, don't let doubt stop your do. And I say that a lot. Don't let doubt stop your do. And what I try to explain to humans is not having doubt in your life is not human. It's, it means you're an alien. Of course you're going to doubt or you're going after the lowest hanging fruit possible. You're going to doubt. It's just part of us as being human beings, but you can't let it stop your actions. So that's very important. Don't let doubt stop your do. I say that all the time. Love that. Okay. Uh, another one is that when I said before is you have to be willing to sacrifice what you like in order to get what you love. And, and I always, <laughs> when I said coach my players, they used to be like, coach, I want to play in here. I want to coach here. I'm like, okay, um, how many days a week are you working out? How many days a week are you picking up a bat basketball? Uh, two. Oh, okay. Well, how many days a week are there? Seven. Are, are you want to play at that school? Well, let me tell you about something about the recruit that just went there. This kid is five inches taller than you. He's better than you right now. And he works out seven days a week. So how do you catch him? Right? People aren't willing to let go of the things. If you want to lose weight, it doesn't matter what your relationship with Ben and Jerry is. You can't eat them every day. <laughs> right? I love Ben and Jerry. Those are my homies. I would <laughs> hang out with them every day if I could. Every day. Ben would be on one side, Jerry on the other side, we'd be eating ice cream and kicking it and not giving a shit. But I will also be 900 pounds. Mm -hmm. also be healthy. So maybe Ben and Jerry have to wait until Saturdays, right? And that's it. And maybe the rest of the week I can work hard and get myself right. So that's another one that I think is, that really sticks with me. And I wrote one today and it's funny, Shelly, every time I write a quote in the morning, I forget it as soon as I write it. <laughs> I love that. I totally get it. I have no idea what I wrote, but I think today's was something about, um, shit. Today was, was something about, oh, I wrote one the, the day before where I go, uh, I said, the cool kids, something about the cool kids, because I was sick of just seeing like all this nonsense. And I, I'm going to look it up just because uh, I want to make sure that I say it right and do it justice. So I said the other day, where is it? Where is it? Okay. Uh, sometimes the cool kids are the fool's kids. Let that sink in. Right? Like sometimes the cool kids are the fool's kids. Let that sink in. Stop chasing these freaking influencers and these people that you think are so dope and they're so great and they're so blah, blah, blah. Just because they have a lot of people that are following them. Right? Sometimes they're the ones that don't know their ass from their elbow. Yeah. A lot of times they're the ones when real shit happens in the world, they're silent because they don't want to affect their coaching sales or their book sales or whatever. I don't give a shit if you buy my book or not, because if it means I'm not going to be who I am, then don't buy my freaking book because you shouldn't anyway. So I always tell people like, I'd rather swim upstream and get to my destination than fly downstream and be somebody else. 
And sell you know, out in the process. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't raised that way. Right. I wasn't raised. I wasn't raised to, to be someone different. I got lucky. I won the lottery with my parents. You know, there's one Cornell Thomas in this world. There'll never be another one like me that looks like me, talks like me, acts like me. And there was never one before. Now you think about the trains of people that, have, uh, that occupy this earth, right? All of the renters that occupy this earth for a hundred years or so and left. There's never going to be another Shelley Paxson. There's never going to be another Cornell Thomas. That is special. So when you have these assholes that are telling you, these influencers telling you, there's nothing special about you. There's nothing, blah, blah, blah. I know what you're trying to say, dummy, but there's something special about them because they were created. Yeah. So if you're a one in whatever gazillion chance that is, there is something special about you. Now, what you do with that gift determines if your life is special or not. Like, are your contributions special? But I don't care if you have nothing or you have everything. There's something special about you because you were created. So don't listen to these influencers that tell you, oh, man, pick yourself up. There's nothing special about you. Blah, blah. No, there's a hundred million things special about you being created. But if you want to have your life be looked at as a special life, that's when you got to put that extra work in. So we are born special. It's what you do after that. Yeah, it's how, I mean, this is recognizing not only, yeah, born special, our, our own, I keep hitting this thing, <laughs> born special, and it's recognizing, acknowledging, and accepting our own unique combination of talents. I think so often we overlook what we were actually born with and we just sort of walk by it because I'm comparing myself to you or to the next person or whatever. And I'm not looking at the inherent gifts that I had or the unique combination of those gifts that only I have. That to me is also how we start to think about our calling, our purpose, our legacy that we want to leave in the world. I look at someone like you, right? And I'm going to use you as an example to embarrass you for a little bit. But I look at someone like you that you're coming out here, you're putting this great message into the world, and yet you're still hungry to do more, mm -hmm. right? That's a gift. You have a gift. There's something special about you, Shelley, that transcends just you being born. You've discovered why you're here. You discover why you were created. And it doesn't matter what you go through. It could be writer's block, it could be whatever. You're still fighting and scrapping to do what you're doing now on a bigger scale. Why? To help freaking humanity. Now, if you don't yeah. think that shit is special, you're on crack, <laughs> right? That's special. There's something beautiful about that. There's something beautiful about you. The reason people know you and want to know you and love talking to you is because there's something beautiful that you are letting out, that you're illuminating when you go into a room that people are like, well, I want to know this Shelly Pax. Like, I don't know her, but what's up with her, right? There's this light that's coming from her. And one of the talents that God gave me is the ability to see that light in other people and tell them about it and tell them how awesome they are. I have no problem pouring into Shelly Paxson because I never want you to forget that. I never want you to go a day where you forget that that's who you are, even on your worst day. And if it's in your worst day and you can't see it, you need to freaking call me because I will remind you. I will, because I've had a few of those days. <laughs> yeah, I will remind you. But it's important uh, we pour into each other and let people know, like, look, man, like, you're special. There's something great about you. There's greatness within you. My brother Rob, my oldest brother, he, I talk to him sometimes, Shelly, and I just start tearing up because he pours into me so much, and it's just so much of love that he pours into me. Like, brother, you don't know how great you are. You don't know how great you're going to be. You don't know, like, all this stuff. And you get off the phone and you hang up and you're just like, I feel like tackling a bear. You know, like there's nothing I can't do, right? So when I have the opportunity, because we don't know how long we're on this planet. When I have the opportunity, I pour into great people like you. Mm. I pour into great people like Mike Vacanti. I pour into great people like Claude Silver. And I let them know how amazing they are. Because you might go a couple of days without people saying it to you because you're saying it to everybody else. Yeah. Right? So I just want to share that real quick. Thank you. Well, it, it feels so good to receive that. So this is the other thing I'm practicing. I'm practicing receiving. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's hard, right? It's so much easier to give. And I'm sure you can relate to that. Yeah. And everybody listening or watching, it's like, you guys, sometimes the hardest part is just like, ah, oh, accepting that. 
and it feels really good. And so thank you for that. I'm super grateful. And it is a nice reminder. And, you know, that is my work in the world, much like yours. I see the gifts in other people. I believe in other people. This is what I do as a coach, right? I help to guide and inspire and, you know, help people fly with their, you know, combination of superpowers maybe they didn't even see. And so, yeah, it's really beautiful. And to be reminded by it, that's why I get out of bed every morning. And I love that you'll love this. And, and it's a fun thing to share with the audience too. I gave a presentation recently. I was talking about this Rebel Leaders Manifesto that I had written. And I've actually sharing it in one of the solo episodes on this podcast. And as I was giving it, like the response was incredible. So it was being done virtually because it was during COVID. And I'm seeing all these messages just fly and fly and people getting really inspired just to kind of awaken the rebel within and just go and get it. And a, one of the women typed, Shelly, you just redefined ROI. It's no longer return on investment. It's ripples of impact. Wow. Wow. Right? I never, I love that. I get goosebumps. I love Me that. too. Every time I say it. So use it. I am putting it now out into the universe. This woman, I was like, oh, Amina, that's it. That's it. Like, and that's how I think about, I share this with my clients. I share it, frankly, with anybody who will listen because I'm like, that's going in my next book for sure. And I'm giving credit to the person who came up with it. Ripples of yep. impact. And that's what I say. Now I'm like one soul at a time. And all I need to know is one soul at a time is another ripple and another ripple yeah. and another ripple. And it's how I think about my work. The book, Shelly, what you just yeah. said is a book. And I can see the cover. Oh. I can see the cover ROI in the front. Because everybody, like a book for like, that is a book. I can see the cover of it. Holy shit. I never even thought about it, but I totally see it now. And you can fill that it book. It is. Because this is what you do every day. Ripples of impact. ROI. I can see, literally see the cover. It's, it's okay. Like, that'd, be a, that's, that'd be an amazing book for you to write. And that'd be an amazing book for every corporation in the world to have a copy of that book right on their desk. Yeah. What is your real ROI? What are you bringing to the community? What are you bringing to the whole ripples of it? That's and beautiful. it starts with each one of us. And then you're right. There's so much about the corporate culture and, and everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess I came out of this with a book assignment, which is awesome. <laughs> you have to go in that. That's oh my God. It's, a, it's amazing. It's so amazing. All right. I know that we, we, we have to wrap up soon. Can I ask you my final questions? I'm doing what I ca I'm calling a rebel roundup. <laughs> Yeah, of course. And so they're not even really rebel questions, but I do a monthly newsletter called Soul Fuel. And Fuel is an acronym for fascinating, underlining, experiencing, and listening. So one of the things I do for my audience is every month I just share what are those things that are doing that for me that are kind of lighting my soul on fire. And I thought, well, this might be kind of fun if I have a couple minutes left in an interview to say, what's lighting your soul on fire? So my first question is under fascinating, like who or what is intriguing you at the moment? Hmm. And these can be short answers. I'm just, I just want to yeah. share a little bit more of you. What's intriguing me right now is the, the, the narrative that has changed because of um, the George Floyd thing. I think if you're really paying attention and not to the idiot box, not to the TV, but if you're really paying attention to the humanity, there are more people that are not brown skin that are in these protests, the peaceful ones in the peaceful protests than anything else. Yeah. And I think the one thing that's fascinating me is how many conversations I've had about race in the last three weeks more than I've had in the last five years. And I talk to people all the time about different topics. That's what's fascinating me right now. What's one takeaway from those conversations that you could share with me slash us, especially as a white woman having this conversation with a black man? Yeah. The biggest thing for me is don't feel sorry for us. There's mm -hmm. a difference between sympathy and empathy, right? I don't want sympathy. I don't, you have nothing to do with my ancestors' struggles, nothing whatsoever. You're a sweetheart, you know, we're like, you have nothing to do with that. You know, I just want empathy. Empathy is understanding 
that there's systemic racism and understanding that there are things in place to keep us oppressed doesn't mean that we have to stay there, but those are things in place. That's, I don't want anybody's sympathy. I just want empathy. You don't have to give me a freaking anything, hand out whatever you, but understand that the, the playing cards that we got, playing cards that we were dealt, they're not the same, right? So just empathy, just have a, having a listening ear. A lot of people talk a lot, you know, to black folks like, well, you know, it's like, listen, listen to what they're saying. And then you have a better understanding of where they're coming from. So I've had beautiful conversations with my friends and a lot of times, you know, there's times we have not disagreed, we have not agreed on things, but it's not an argument. It's not us yelling. It's us sharing ideas. Whatever you feel, you feel, right? And whatever I feel, I feel. And we just bring it to the table and we go from there. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So the next is you underlining. So what I, I use an orange highlighter. And I always like, I, I read people's books. Yours are on my list actually. So what's got your highlighter in overdrive? It might be a proverbial highlighter. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, I would say the thing that has my highlighter in overdrive the most is my, uh, my app that I'm working on. Um, just getting that to look the way I want it to look and to feel the way I want it to feel. And um, just bringing it to human beings as like something where it's like, look, here's this, super cheap thing where you're going to be able to have me and not have any recurring calls. Like I was like, how do I make it the cheapest thing in the world? Right? Like I was like, how do I make it like five ninety nine or whatever, but I have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of quotes and all these videos and my an audio book, my third book is in the audio form in the, on the app and just getting it tight. And that's a thing that is like, I just been highlight like I'm, in my mind I'm like okay how do I make it better how do I make it better how do I make it better yeah so hopefully in like the next week or so it'll be out but uh, so is this uh, like pocket Cornell like I can literally be like okay I need a coach I need inspiration right now you see my face there's videos of purpose adversity like all these different topics there's quotes like in the audiobook I always tell people the worst thing that you could do is have me do an audiobook because I'm such a clown, like I'm so goofy that like it's so much longer because I'm joking around and I'm just like, you know, I'm like, oh, do this. I'm like, oh, wait, are you driving? No, th th don't do that. Like, look, look at the road. Like, I'm just, I throw my little things in there. Uh, and when I talk about my mom, I got super emotional. I have a chapter called Tina Thomas the Great. Uh, but I keep everything in. I don't edit anything. I just keep it, I just keep it raw. Oh, I love it. it. Good. So, so yeah. is this going to be like a membership thing? Like I just, no, I pay... Oh, okay. One time you pay five ninety nine dollars one time and that's awesome. it. You have nice. everything. You have access to everything. There's no like, oh, and you have to pay another month for six bucks. The, the cost of a latte, you get Cornell in your pocket. Oh my God. I love it. Pocket Cornell. You guys, you guys heard it here first. So we'll make sure that um, if you give us that, we can put it in the show notes too. So if you're looking to get subscribers on that for sure. Okay. What are you experiencing? Like who, what, or where is giving you rocket fuel? Yeah, um, I would say my diet right now is giving me rocket fuel. I'm doing a different diet that I, for the last 30 days, and it's it's been like a challenge, but because uh, a lot of like, you know, you're limiting a lot of carbs and a lot of sugar. And uh, that's what I, I mean, I feel so energetic, though. Yeah. And I feel like so like, man, I'm getting rid of these like this. this I mean, sugar's a drug. Get rid of some of this stuff. And it's like, I would never go zero carb, zero sugar, because, you know, I want to be human. And when me and you go to Chicago and I want to get a slice of stuff pizza, we're going to have to have a slice of stuff pizza. It's just, it is what it is. I don't care. Um, but for, I said for 30 days, I'm going to challenge myself to do this. And it's, it's given me a lot of energy and it's like, I'm fire. I'm even more fired up than I usually am, which is hard, which is crazy to say. So that is, that is, you, you strike yeah. me as sort of like the energizer bunny type, yeah. right? Like you've always got the energy. I'm on keto. I, I kicked sugar and I love it. Like I never want sugar back in my life. What did oh, you say? Oh, you are? That's what I'm on. It's another thing we got in common, my friend. There you go. High five. Let's keep each other honest on that too. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Like I prick my finger every day and I'm like those ketones better be strong. <laughs> so I'm like, God I'll, I'll damn it. I, <laughs> what? How long have you been doing it? Um, so this round I'm on week six. Wow. Awesome. That is awesome. How, I, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, it's, I think that whenever like when I, I'm going to wean myself off it and then use it 
to reset myself. Like I never yeah. want to go back yeah. to heavy carbs. I never want to go back to a lot of sugars ever in my life again. This really woke me up in terms of like how to eat. Um, but I'm, I'm going to, whenever I want to reset, it's such a good reset to do. It is a total, it is it's a total, total reset and it's so much fun. So here's the last, I could talk to you about keto forever. So when we do get together for that slice of pizza and we're totally breaking the keto thing, we'll talk more about it. So the last one is listening. Who or what are you listening to that's lighting you up? My kids. Mm. My Bryce is seven and I is five. And we're having these conversations that are getting deeper. And I was talking to them about like gratitude and stuff like that. I asked them about their day. And, and yesterday, Bryce was on the bed and he's at nature camp at mom's work. And he came home and I said, well, what'd you do yesterday? And he goes, I don't know. I go, no, that's not an acceptable answer. I said, you know what you did. I said, you, you know something that you've done. You might not remember everything, but I don't know it's not an acceptable answer. That's a lazy answer because you're not diving into your story. I said, but I want to know what you did. What was the first thing you did when you got there? We put our backpacks up. What did you do after that? We sat in a circle where our name was. What did you do after that? Well, we went by the stream. And so after we finished, it was like seven or eight things. So I said, you see why we don't use I don't know? So imagine if you ask daddy how he's doing, I said, I don't know. And I just kind of walked away. That's dismissive. I said, always remember. So his homework was today was learn five kids' names in camp and remember three or four things that he did for camp from a highlight that he can talk to me about afterward. So that's the, listening to my kids is something that just blows me away every day. Well, what an invaluable thing to share with them because those are powerful life lessons, you know, as you go on. And so often we just describe like generically what we're experiencing. It's like, well, what if you actually sink into all five senses and savor those moments and then share that? It's so much richer. 100%. Yeah, that's so, what you're teaching them. Conversations. Oh yeah. All right. That's a, that's another one. I'm so I have kept you long. Thank you for hanging in there because this is awesome. I literally could, did not want to stop this conversation. I still don't, but I know I have a responsibility to come in somewhere around an hour. So I'm so grateful for like all the nuggets of wisdom, all of the beautiful mindset and positivity stuff and so much new stuff that you're coming out with that me and everyone else get to experience. So where can people find you? Where do you play most often? Uh, Instagram is at Cornell Thomas, uh, 34, I believe. And, uh, everything else is Cornell Thomas, uh, and TikTok is Cornell. You see this just silly, silly, silly videos, uh, Cornell Thomas. So Cornell Thomas 34 and everything's Cornell Thomas. If you message me, understand, I'm going to message you back. So don't be thrown. Like people always get surprised when I go speak at these big conferences and they'll be like, you know, they'll message me they'll be like, and I message them right back. They're like, Oh, you message back. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? Not message you back? Exactly. <laughs> but like, you know what? You realize like that makes you unique because uh, people are surprised when I respond, when they send me stuff about my book and they're like, oh my God, your book has changed my life. And I've been searching for that thing. I'm like, well, of course I'm going to respond to you. You just made my day. This is like another ripple in that wave. This is amazing. This is why I'm here. Yeah. So I mean, and that's the difference. Like that's why people like us, the reason that what we're going to do is just going to keep growing exponentially is because we'll never be different than what we are right mm. now. We'll always be that type of pe those type of people where we love the connection and we love talking to one another. I told people, I was like, the, the minute you come to an event and you see me charge for a picture to take with me, I've lost my way. That's right? when I get I've to come and kick your ass. That's when the yeah. true ass kicking. Bring a shovel. <laughs> Hit me with a shovel, please. I was like, because... That to me is like, that means that I've completely, it's a different person. It's a different version of me. It's not Tina yeah. Thomas. You yeah. Know? I just love the connection. So I love, uh, you know, I miss speaking. I'm talking to people from like Netherlands and Africa and all this. And they're like, when this opens up, we can't wait to have you. And I was like, you have no idea. I'm hugging everybody. I don't give a oh. trip. I'm everybody. I am there. Literally, you are going to have to pry me off of you. Like, that's how bad I want to be hugging people. They're going to be like, okay, now you're creepy. <laughs> be like, I was like, get, get my, I'm going to be like a tick. Like my claws are going to be in you and you're going to have to like burn me off. <laughs> like, I totally feel that way right now. I'll be like looking over your head. I'm like, well, so this is the uh, talk that we're doing today. This is just Shelly. Don't mind her. She'll be here for the next hour. <laughs> exactly. She'll just be hanging off my side. 
oh, but I feel it. Like I'm so, I'm such a hugger. I'm like, that is the thing that I miss the most 1000%. So I feel you, I feel you on that. I am so grateful that you joined us and that you and I, I love that this was like our first legit conversation live and everybody gets to experience this because it was amazing. It was so fun. It was awesome. And it's the first of like a million more conversations. Oh my God. To be continued. And we have, we have a lot of accountability to each other now. We a lot of stuff came up in this conversation. So I'm hoping there'll be a to be continued. So maybe as you start to launch some of those other things and some of your new books come out, we'll do a, we'll do a part two of the Shelly Cornell show. <laughs> you're going to be on my, my storytellers podcast. Okay. In the morning. Okay, we'll do that too. But in the meantime, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did and stay tuned for the next Rebel Souls podcast. Thanks again, Cornell. Bye-bye. Hey, Rebel. Thanks for listening. If you were inspired by what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review so our fellow Rebel Souls can find us. We have big work to do together. And if you want to dive deeper, head on over to my website at sylbatical.com and follow me at sylbatical on Instagram. Until next time, stay bold, brave, and badass, and never stop asking, what am I rebelling for?